First off, we want to give a big thanks to Vikings War of Clans for sponsoring this video. Their development team asked me to download and play the game, and I thought, why not? It's free to download. After a few minutes, I was addicted. I love Vikings because it reminds me of awesome strategy games from the 90s like Command & Conquer and Age of Empires. Vikings is also great because I can pick it up and play it anytime I want, and I can play it for as long as I feel like it. Besides having impressive strategic gameplay, the game also has brilliant 3D graphics that transports you to the world of the Vikings. In the game, you're the Jarl, and you're the head of your entire kingdom. From there, you collect your resources and build your army. One of the best parts about Vikings is that there are so many ways to play. You can be a conquering warlord or focus on gradual expansion. Personally, I like to focus on science and building a highly technological kingdom. I also really enjoy the live events and competitions and I'm always looking forward to the next one starting. Please help support my channel by downloading Vikings for free only from my links in the description box and get the special bonus of 200 gold coins and a protective shield. Don't forget to look me up and join my Vikings clan under my nickname, Criminally Listed. So please help support Criminally Listed and download Vikings War of Clans today. Number 3. Michael Anderson In the fall of 2007, Catherine Olsen was 24 years old. Catherine's father, Rolf, was a Lutheran pastor and her mother Nancy taught English in high school. Catherine lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota with a roommate. Catherine was a bright but impulsive young woman. She was the co-valedictorian when she graduated from high school in 2002. She went on to study theater and Hispanic studies at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. She graduated in 2006. Catherine was a member of her church's choir and she volunteered for several outreach groups. Catherine loved children and she enjoyed working with them. Occasionally, to earn money, she found babysitting work on the online classified website, Craigslist. In October 2009, she responded to an ad looking for a babysitter. The person who posted the ad replied to her email. The author claimed that their name was Amy. Amy wrote that they were looking for someone to babysit at their home in Savage, Minnesota on October 25, 2007. Savage is a suburban city that is about 15 miles southwest of downtown Minnesota. Amy provided Catherine with an address and a cell phone number. On the morning of October 25, 2007, Catherine told her roommate that she was going out to babysit at a residence in Savage. She told her roommate that she met the client through Craigslist. She also told him that the client seemed kind of strange. Her roommate left their home at about 8 a.m. At about 9 a.m., Catherine called the number Amy had given her. Catherine then got into her car and drove to the address that Amy had provided for her. The next morning, at about 8 o'clock, an employee of the Parks Department in Savage called the police out to one of the local parks. A purse had been found in a garbage can. The officer took the purse back to the police station. Inside the purse, he found Catherine's driver's license and a phone number. The officer called the phone number and left a voicemail, saying that Catherine's purse had been found and she could pick it up at the police station. Eight hours later, the officer was told that Catherine's mother, Nancy, had called and said that either she or Catherine would come to the police station to collect the purse. The officer decided to call Nancy. Nancy told the officer that she had been trying to get in contact with her daughter 
but she had not been able to get a hold of her. Every time she called Catherine's cell phone, her call went directly to voicemail, and she thought that this was odd. Nancy told the officer that she had spoken to Catherine's roommate. He said the last time he saw or heard from Catherine was the morning before. She had been planning on going to the babysitting job in Savage. He also said that Catherine met the client through Craigslist and she had mentioned that the client was strange. The officer then decided to talk to Catherine's roommate himself. Catherine's roommate was able to get into Catherine's email box and he printed off the emails between Catherine and the person who identified themselves as Amy. In one of the emails, Amy provided an address in Savage and a phone number. The officer then had a detective get involved in the investigation. At about 5.15 p.m. on the day after Catherine went to the babysitting job, the detective went to the address in Savage. It was a dilapidated house that was aqua in color. When the detective arrived at the house, he found that no one was home. The detective talked to the neighbors, and he learned that Steve and Barbara Anderson lived in the house with their 20-year-old son, Michael. The detective left a business card at the Andersons' home, and he went back to the police station. Meanwhile, the police officer who retrieved Catherine's purse from the garbage can went back to the same garbage can. He remembered that when he pulled the purse out of the garbage can, there was a garbage bag sitting on top of it. When the officer got back to the garbage can, he found the bag and he looked inside of it. He found a light blue bath towel with red spots on it. The officer immediately thought that the red spots were blood. He called the detective who came to the garbage can. The detective took the towel out of the bag and noticed that there was an object wrapped up in the towel. It was a smashed cell phone. Catherine's parents, Rolf and Nancy, were shown the cell phone and they said that it belonged to their daughter. One thing the investigators noted was that a name had been written on the towel in marker. That name was Michael Anderson. The detective knew that Michael Anderson lived at the address that was given to Catherine by the person who claimed to be Amy. Not long after the discovery of the cell phone, the detective received a phone call. It was Barbara Anderson. She was calling because she had found the detective's business card. The detective told Barbara that they were looking for her son, Michael. She told him that Michael was at work. He refueled planes at the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. Barbara gave the detective Michael's cell phone number. It was the same phone number that Amy had given Catherine. 20 year old Michael Anderson was arrested as he was leaving work. A search of the area close to where the purse was found was conducted. A helicopter was called in to aid in the search. The pilot spotted a car that was the same year, model, and color as Catherine's car. It was in the parking lot of a nature reserve that was a little more than a mile away from where the purse was found. The officer who retrieved the purse from the garbage can went to the parking lot and determined that it was Catherine's car. He looked in the trunk and he found Catherine's dead body stuffed in a sleeping bag. She had been shot once in the back. It would later be determined that the murder weapon was a 357 Magnum handgun. Catherine had not been sexually assaulted. The police searched Michael Anderson's home. 
In his bedroom, which was on the second floor, they found a shell casing for a 357 Magnum. They also found some blood splattered on his bedroom walls and on his mattress. On the steps that led from the main floor to the second floor, they found blood smears. The blood smears seemed to indicate that someone had dragged a body down the steps. Investigators also found blood on Michael's shoes. Hours after Catherine's body was found, Michael was interviewed by the detective. Michael claimed he didn't kill Catherine. The detective then confronted Michael with all the evidence they found. Michael then said he was there when Catherine was killed, but he wasn't the murderer. Instead, he claimed that his friend was the killer. Michael said that his friend shot Catherine because he thought it would be funny. Michael Anderson was subsequently charged with first degree murder. He went to trial in March 2009, about a year and a half after the murder. The prosecutor said that the evidence showed that Michael pretended to be a woman who needed a babysitter to lure an unsuspecting woman to his home. When Catherine arrived at his home, he somehow convinced her to come into his bedroom. He then shot her to death simply because he wanted to know what it felt like to take someone's life. Michael's defense lawyer acknowledged that Michael did pose as a woman and lure Catherine to his home. But Michael's lawyer argued that Michael never planned on killing her. Michael's lawyer explained that Michael was a 20-year-old high school dropout who had never been on a date. He posted the ad and lured Catherine to his home because he was looking for some sex that was consensual or romance. The defense also acknowledged that Michael pulled out the gun, but he claimed that the gun accidentally fired. The defense wanted a doctor who examined Michael to testify. The doctor had diagnosed Michael with Asperger's syndrome. The defense said that the syndrome would explain why Michael thought that posting an ad saying he was a woman looking for a babysitter could lead to a romantic encounter. The syndrome also made Michael clumsy, which would explain how he accidentally fired the gun. But the judge did not allow the doctor to testify. Michael Anderson was found guilty of first degree murder and on April 1st, 2009, he was sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. The murder of 24 year old Catherine Olson was the first homicide associated with Craigslist. In May 2009, there was a memorial service held in Catherine's honor. Craigslist founder Craig Newmark spoke at the memorial. He cautioned people to be careful when using the internet. Newmark also contributed an undisclosed amount to a scholarship in memory of Catherine. Catherine's parents, Rolf and Nancy, never blamed Craigslist for Catherine's murder. The couple said that the loss of their daughter was incredibly hard on them, but they have tried to move on with their lives. They said that they know they can never go back to the way things used to be. Instead, they have had to learn to live in a new normal. Nancy and Rolf said that their lives after the murder of Catherine is like an orchestra with a single out of tune instrument. Number two, William Melcher Dinkle. In the autumn of 2006, Celia Blay was 60 years old. Blay was a retired school teacher and she lived in Maiden Bradley, Wiltshire, England. Blay was dealing with some grief after losing both of her parents. Looking for comfort, she turned to the internet. One day while she was surfing, she accidentally stumbled upon something she didn't know existed. 
It was websites, chat rooms, and news groups dedicated to suicide. One online community she found was a place where people talked about contemplating suicide and the best way to do it. Most people in the community would discourage users from killing themselves. But since it's the internet, a small percentage of users would encourage people to take their own life. Police started corresponding with some of the people in the community and she encouraged them to get help instead of doing something irreversible. One of the people she talked to was a 17-year-old girl from South America. The girl told Blay she had a specific time and date planned for when she was going to hang herself. She also said that she was in a suicide pact with someone she met online. Blay asked about the person and she said that the user posted under the name Lai Dao. Supposedly, Lai Dao was American, she was in her 20s, and she was a nurse. The 17-year-old girl said that Lai Dao had suggested being on webcam when she took her life so that she wouldn't be alone when she died. Lai Dao said she would take her life afterward. For obvious reasons, Celia Bly was disturbed by this. So she discussed the matter with some other people in the chat room where she had met the girl. It turned out that several other people had also made a suicide pact with Lai Dao. Lai Dao had encouraged all of them to hang themselves while she watched on webcam. Blaze soon found a dozen people who had made a suicide pact with Lai Dao. Lai Dao also encouraged people to perform self-harm while she watched over the webcam. Blay went to the police in her village, but they didn't show any interest in pursuing the matter. They told her that if she didn't like what was happening online, then to turn the other way. Then Blay learned that the same user may have been using another screen name, Falcon Girl. Falcon Girl had been making similar suicide packs as Lai Dao. Blay and a friend who had been talking to Falcon Girl decided to set up a sting. They asked Falcon Girl for a photograph of herself and the user sent them one. It was a photograph of a family and Falcon Girl said that she was the woman in the photograph. Then, for some reason during their chat, Falcon Girl's webcam came on. That's when Celia Play saw that Lai Dao and Falcon Girl was not a woman. Instead, it was a middle-aged man. They managed to snap a photograph of the man on one of their cell phones. Lai and her friend realized that he was in the photograph that he had sent them. He was the man sitting next to the woman that he claimed to be. Later, in an email, the man accidentally used his real name, William Melcher Dinkle. Blay investigated Melcher Dinkle, and she learned that he really was a nurse. He was in his 40s, he was married and had two daughters, and they lived in Faribault, Minnesota. Blay also learned that another username Melcher Dinkle was using was Cammy D. For a year and a half, Celia Blade tracked out people who had talked to Melcher Dinkle under his aliases. She found nearly 50 people who had talked to Melcher Dinkle about suicide. She then went back to the police, but once again, they had no interest in pursuing an investigation. Blade also tried to pass the information on to the FBI, but they did not receive it. Around this time, 18-year-old Nadia Kajuji was attending Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Kajuji was a freshman who studied law and politics. She had moved into a dormitory on campus in September 2007. Her family lived in Brampton, Ontario, which is about 250 miles away from the school. 
The first few months away from home were rough for Kajuji. She had broken up with her long-term boyfriend and started dating another young man. During their relationship, they had sex and the condom broke. Kajuji took the morning after pill, but it didn't work. She soon found out that she was pregnant, but it was not long before she miscarried. Kajuji was disturbed by the fact that she was not able to choose if she wanted to be a mother or not. Sometime afterward, the relationship with the new boyfriend came to an end. Kajuji kept a video diary and she often talked about unrequented love. Kajuji battled depression during the school year. She was eventually prescribed drugs for her depression and to help her sleep and she was required to see a counselor. It turned out that for months, Kajuji had been talking to someone online with the username Kami D and Kami D had the email address falcon underscore girl underscore 507 at hotmail.com. Kami told Kajuji that for the past eight months, she had thought about killing herself. Kami explained that she was a nurse and she had seen many people who took their own life or attempted to take their own life. She realized the quickest and most efficient way was to hang yourself. Kami said that when the time came, that was what she was going to do. Kami frequently suggested to Gajuji that she should hang herself while she was on her webcam. Kami and Kajuji exchanged hundreds of messages. Kami acted like she was understanding and caring, but she never advised Kajuji to seek help. Instead, Kami kept encouraging Kajuji to take her own life, preferably on webcam so she could watch it. In March 2008, Kajuji told Kami that she was going to go through with it. On March 10th, 2008, Kajuji told Kami that she was going to do it that night. Kami simply replied, okay. That night, there was a blizzard in Ottawa. During the blizzard, 18-year-old Nadia Kajuji left her dorm with her ice skates. The next day, she was reported missing. About two weeks after Kajuji walked out into the snowstorm, Celia Blake got in contact with Canada's National Police Force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is also known by its acronym, the RCMP. The RCMP did some investigating into the connection between Nadia Kajuji and William Melcher Dinkel, but they determined it would be too difficult to pursue charges. Melcher Dinkel was an American citizen who wasn't even in Canada when Kajuji went missing. In fact, he was over a thousand miles away. So he physically did not do anything to Kajuji. Also, Blay only had evidence that someone from Melcher Dinkel's home had conversed with Kajuji. A spokesperson for the RCMP said that there was no definitive evidence that Melcher Dinkel was the person who was doing the corresponding. After all, Melcher Dinkel lived in the house with his wife and his two daughters. Celia Blay was discouraged by the RCMP's reaction, but she was not defeated. She then found out about a police unit called the Task Force on Internet Crimes Against Children. They were located in St. Paul, Minnesota. Blay was hopeful because Melcher Dinkel lived in Minnesota and Minnesota has laws regarding encouraging people to die by suicide. Blay sent all the information that she had collected on Melcher Dinkel to the task force. The task force then began to investigate William Melcher Dinkel. About six weeks after 18-year-old Nadia Kajuji left her dorm room during the snowstorm, her body was pulled from the Rideau River. 
The police had gone through Kijuji's computer. Despite the frequent encouragement to hang herself, Kijuji did not want to end her life that way. She wanted her death to look like an accident in the hopes that it might be easier for her family to accept her death. She had jumped into the river off a bridge that was close to the school campus with her ice skates on. She thought that the weight of the skates and the current would pull her under the water. She would either drown or die from hypothermia. Even after Nadia Kajuji's body was found, and as the task force on internet crimes against children investigated Willie Melcher Dinkel, he continued to talk to suicidal people online and he would encourage them to take their own lives. In October 2009, about nine months after Celia Blay passed her information along to the task force, investigators went to Melcher Dinkel's home. He was cooperative and he let them into his home. When the investigators told Melcher Dinkel why they were there, he admitted he posed as a female nurse online. He also admitted that he encouraged people to kill themselves. Melcher Dinkel said they encouraged about 20 people to kill themselves, entered in suicide packs with about 10 people, and he thought that five of the people he encouraged may have taken their own life. He confessed that one of those people was Nadia Kajuji. Melcher Dinkel was asked why he would do something like this, and he said it was because he liked the thrill of the chase. He also said that he had a suicide fetish. The police looked through Melcher Dinkel's computer and they found a photograph of Nadia Kajuji. They also found messages between Melcher Dinkel and a 32 year old man named Mark Dryborough who lived in Coventry, England. Dryborough had suffered from depression for over 10 years. He often felt like a failure because he could not hold down a job. Then, sometime in 2005, Dryborough started talking to Lie Dow, which was, of course, William Melcher Dinkel. Dryborough formed what he thought was a suicide pact with Melcher Dinkel. Melcher Dinkel promised to take his life after Dryborough did it. Melcher Dinkel gave him specific directions on how to hang himself, which included putting the noose behind his left ear. The last time Melcher Dinkel and Dryborough talked was on July 27, 2005. Hours later, Dryborough hanged himself exactly the way Melcher Dinkel told him to do it. The noose was even behind his left ear. At first, the police did not charge Melcher Dinkel with anything. But then six months later, in April 2010, William Melcher Dinkel was charged with two counts of aiding in a suicide regarding the deaths of Mark Dryborough and Nadia Kajuji. In March 2011, Melcher Dinkel was convicted on both counts. Two months later, he was sentenced to 360 days in jail plus 10 years of probation. Melcher Dinkel's lawyer appealed and in March 2014, the Minnesota Supreme Court reversed the conviction because of the wording of the conviction. William Melcher Dinkel went to trial again in September 2014. He was convicted of assisting Mark Dryborough in his suicide. In the death of Nadia Kajuji, he was convicted of the lesser crime of attempting to assist in a suicide. He was sentenced to three years of prison but the sentence was suspended. Instead, he was to spend 360 days in jail. Due to time served, he was released six months later in February 2015. At William L. Schrittinkel's second trial, he apologized for what he had done and he said he wants to be a contributing member of society. Celia Blay was hailed for her hard work and determination in exposing William Melshirt Dinkel. 
She has been compared to Miss Marple, the protagonist in several prominent Agatha Christie novels and short stories. Celia Blay believes that at least eight people that Melcher Dinkle was talking to ended up dying by suicide, but she says she would not be surprised if the real number was in the double digits. Number 1. Lisa Montgomery Skidmore is a small town in northern Missouri. It's situated about 25 miles from the Missouri-Iowa border. In the winter of 2004, less than 350 people lived in the town. Two of those people were Zeb and Bobby Joe Stinnett. They had been childhood friends and then high school sweethearts. They got married two years earlier. The lead up to Christmas 2004 was an exciting time for the couple. Bobby Joe, who was 23, was eight months pregnant with the couple's first child. Zeb and Bobby Joe both worked at a manufacturing plant that was two blocks from their home. Bobby Joe's real passion was breeding rat terriers. She and Zeb had their own dog breeding business called Bobby Joe's Happy Havens Farm. Bobby Joe always met with prospective buyers to ensure that the dogs they sold were going to a good home. She did a lot of her business online through her website. At the end of her pregnancy, Bobby Jo planned on quitting her job at the manufacturing plant to focus on raising her child and dog breeding. Bobby Jo also liked to talk about rat terriers and dog breeding online. She often posted on message boards and she was a regular in a chat room called Ratter Chatter. On the afternoon of December 16, 2004, Bobby Jo was home alone. Zeb was at work and she was home because she was on maternity leave. The day before, Bobby Joe had set up a meeting with a prospective buyer. The meeting was with someone she thought she only knew online. She was supposed to meet with a person at around 2.30 that afternoon. The prospective buyer's name was supposedly Darlene Fisher and she apparently lived in Fairfax, Missouri which is only about 20 miles from Skidmore. Bobby Joe and Darlene had talked online several times in the past eight months. Then the day before, Darlene had emailed Bobby Joe because she was interested in buying a rat terrier. Bobby Joe emailed her back with directions to her home. Bobby Joe also posted a message on a forum that she and Darlene frequented. Bobby Joe said she was looking forward to meeting Darlene in person. At about 2.30 that afternoon, Bobby Joe's mother, Becky Harper, called Bobby Joe. Becky explained to her daughter that her vehicle was getting some work done and she needed a ride to the garage. Bobby Joe said she was meeting a potential buyer, but she said she would pick her mother up at 3.30. Then Bobby Joe told her mother that someone was there and she had to go. She then hung up the phone. At 3.30, Becky Harper was surprised to see that her daughter wasn't waiting to pick her up. She phoned Bobby Joe several times, but no one answered. Bobby Joe only lived two blocks from her mother's place of employment. When Bobby Joe didn't answer the phone, Becky walked over to her daughter's home. She was horrified by what she found. Her daughter was lying in a pool of blood. She called 911 and she explained to the dispatcher that it looked like her daughter's stomach had exploded. When the paramedics arrived, they discovered that the baby was gone. Sadly, it was too late to help 23-year-old Bobby Joe Stinnett. The medical examiner would later determine that Bobby Joe was strangled from behind with a rope. 
and the killer performed a cesarean section with a paring knife. It's believed that Bobby Jo regained consciousness during the delivery and the killer had to strangle her again. After the body was found, a neighbor of Zed and Bobby Joe came over to talk to the police. He told them that around the time of the murder, he saw a reddish pink foreign car parked in their driveway. The police immediately had a suspect, Darlene Fisher from Fairfax, Missouri. Several people knew that Darlene was supposed to visit Bobby Joe around the time of the murder. The sheriff looked at the records for Fairfax and discovered that no one with that name lived in the area. The sheriff then had an expert go through Bobby Joe's computer. He found the emails and some messages posted by the person claiming to be Darlene Fisher. The expert found Darlene's ISP and then tracked her to a server in Topeka, Kansas. The expert went through the records of the server and looked at the times when Darlene Fisher posted the comments. He discovered that the server was accessed at those times by someone using dial-up internet. He got the phone number associated with the internet account. Then he learned it was the home phone number of Kevin Montgomery. Kevin lived in Melbourne, Kansas which is about 175 miles from Skidmore. The day after the murder, the police scoped out Kevin Montgomery's home and they noticed a red Toyota parked in the driveway. The investigators decided to talk to Kevin. Kevin was at home with his wife, 35-year-old Lisa Montgomery, and a newborn baby girl. The couple explained that yesterday, Lisa, who was pregnant, had gone shopping in Topeka, which is about 40 miles from their home in Melbourne. That afternoon, Lisa called Kevin and told him that she had gone into labor. She said she had given birth at a woman's clinic in Topeka. She claimed that after she gave birth, she was released because she and the baby were in good health. Kevin said that he and his two children from a previous relationship, who were both in their teens, drove to Topeka and met Lisa and the baby in the parking lot of a Long John Silver's. Then they all drove back to Melbourne. Earlier that day, before the police showed up, Kevin and Lisa had run a few errands and showed off the baby. The investigators thought it was a strange story, so they checked with the woman's clinic. The staff of the clinic said that no one gave birth at their clinic the day before. Lisa was confronted about this, and she changed her story. She said she had actually given birth at home. So the investigators asked to see evidence of that. But she was unable to produce any evidence. Lisa then admitted she had killed Bobby Jo Stinnett and it was her baby. Lisa was arrested and the baby was given to her father, Zeb. The baby was healthy except for a cut above one of her eyes. She was given the name Victoria Jo, which is what her mother wanted to name her. The police and the district attorney then began to investigate Lisa Montgomery so that they could try to understand what type of woman could have committed such a horrifying crime. Lisa Montgomery was born Lisa Marie Mathers in Fort Lewis, Washington in February 1968. Her father, Edgar, was in the military and when Lisa was born, he was stationed in Korea. Her mother, Judy, was a homemaker. Judy and Edgar's marriage was turbulent and Judy filed for divorce when Lisa was three. Judy then started dating and eventually moved in with an older man. He was alcoholic and abusive. For several years, he sexually abused Lisa. 
One night, just before Lisa's 16th birthday, Judy even caught him doing it. Not long afterward, the man moved out. Lisa said that her mother blamed her for the abuse and for her husband leaving. But Judy denied saying anything like that. After Judy's husband moved out, he continued to harass Judy. Judy was fearful that her estranged husband would harm her or her children. At the time, she was living with her five children, including Lisa, in a trailer just outside of Sperry, Oklahoma. So Judy reached out to the local sheriff, a man named Richard Bowman. Richard would go on to leave his wife, whom he had been with for over 20 years, to be with Judy. Richard and Judy would eventually get married. Roger had a son named Carl. Lisa and Carl first met when Lisa was 16 and Carl was 23. The next year, they were dating. On Lisa's 18th birthday, she moved in with Carl. Not long after Lisa moved in, she became pregnant. So she and Carl got married in a small ceremony. Lisa gave birth to a daughter in January 1987. Over the next three years, Lisa gave birth to three more children. Lisa's children later described her as cold and distant. In 1990, Lisa underwent a procedure where her tubes were cauterized, leaving her sterile. Carl said that they had talked about the procedure and Lisa agreed to do it because she was done having children. However, Lisa would later say that Carl and her mother forced her to do it. Lisa was repeatedly unfaithful in their marriage and she and Carl got divorced in the early 1990s. Lisa fought for full custody of their four children and she was awarded it. But at that point, she was dating a new man and she had little interest in her children. So the children ended up spending more time at Carl's home. Then in early 1995, Lisa and Carl got back together and they got remarried. But Lisa continued to have affairs. They divorced again in 1997. This time, Carl was able to get custody of the two oldest children. In 1999, Lisa got a job as a security guard at a manufacturing plant in Topeka. It was there that she met Kevin Montgomery. They started dating and they were soon wed. Carl went on to meet a woman named Vanessa and they got married. Carl did not think that Lisa was a competent mother, so he fought for custody of his two youngest children. Then in the spring of 2004, Lisa started telling people that she was pregnant with twins. She said she was due in December. She started to wear loose and baggy clothing. She then told people that she lost one of the babies, but the other one was healthy. On December 10th, 2004, Carl filed a motion to get permanent custody of his two youngest children. His attorney was going to present evidence that proved that Lisa was lying about being pregnant. And it was not the first time Lisa had faked a pregnancy after she had her tubes cauterized. Carl knew of four other times that Lisa said she was pregnant after she had been sterilized. The motion argued that these actions demonstrated that Lisa was an unfit mother. Four days after the motion was filed, Lisa found out about the motion. Lisa told Carl that she would prove he was a liar. Two days later, Bobby Joe Stinnett was killed and her baby was stolen. The police also learned that Lisa and Bobby Joe had met in real life before the murder. 
They met in April 2004 at a dog show. Lisa's youngest daughter was deeply interested in dog breeding and she talked to Bobby Joe often online. After meeting at the dog show, Lisa also conversed with Bobby Joe online and not just as Darlene Fisher. Lisa chatted with Bobby Joe as herself, but she wasn't truthful. Lisa told Bobby Joe that she was pregnant and she was due just a few weeks before her. Since Lisa, Bobby Joe had met in person before, people wonder what exactly happened when Lisa arrived at Bobby Joe's home on the day of the murder. When Bobby Joe had recognized her, he realized she wasn't Darlene Fisher. While that is certainly possible, another possibility is that Lisa could have just told Bobby Joe that she was in the neighborhood and she stopped in to say hi. Regardless, Bobby Joe obviously didn't feel threatened by Lisa and she let Lisa into her home. Lisa Montgomery went to trial in October 2007. Her husband, Kevin, was not charged with any crimes because he was not aware of his wife's plans. Since Lisa had crossed state lines while committing her crimes, she was tried in federal court instead of at a state level. She pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The trial lasted for 11 days. Then the jury deliberated for five hours. Lisa was found guilty and she was ultimately sentenced to death. Of the 62 inmates on federal death row, Lisa Montgomery is the only woman. She is currently being held in the Federal Medical Center Carswell in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Hopefully you found it interesting. If you did, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash criminallylisted. You can also check out our website, criminallylisted.com, where you can suggest cases, buy merch, and find out about an exclusive podcast. But that is all for today. Thank you again for watching.